welcome back for another Sheriff of Sodium video. Today I'm going to share with you a brief presentation that I got to give earlier this week. It was at a meeting that was convened to consider whether certain changes to the residency selection process might be worthwhile. And here today in this context, I'm going to be intentionally vague about what that meeting was and the specifics of what were discussed, because it's really not germane to the point that I'm making. The thesis of this talk is one that I think is broadly applicable, and I thought that a broader audience might benefit from hearing it. My job in this talk was not to be too prescriptive about what changes should be made, although if you followed me for any length of time, you probably know how I feel about certain issues here. My job was instead to set up the, the premise that, that we have a system that's potentially on the brink of collapse. I think that if you ask many applicants how the residency selection process is working, I think you'll hear that it's, that it's expensive and it's stressful and it's burdensome, and I think you'll get that answer from many programs too. But even if you're a program that's benefiting from the current system, or even if you're an organization that benefits from the current system, what I want to present here is an argument for why the system may be closer to collapse than you think it is. And that's a serious talk and all. But I was also giving this the week before Christmas. And so in the hope of honoring the season, and, and maybe also highlighting some of the Dickensian aspects of residency selection, I decided to present this as a Christmas carol for the match. We all know A Christmas Carol. Even if you haven't read the book, and to be honest, most of us probably haven't, A Christmas Carol has become such a holiday touchstone that it's been parodied and lampooned. It's become a, a, an embedded part of holiday culture in, in the United States. Dickens published the book on December 19, 1843, and the first edition sold out before Christmas. The first edition carried this inscription. I've endeavored in this ghostly little book to raise the ghost of an idea which shall not put my readers out of humor with themselves, with each other, with the season, or with me, may it haunt their houses pleasantly. And I included the inscription because honestly, this is very similar to what I wanted to do with this talk. I wanted to raise the ghost of an idea. And although I didn't really want to put people out of humor, um, I, I hope this idea does trouble people because I think that it's a very realistic scenario. I think it should make you think whether our current system is sustainable or whether it may be at risk of collapse if we continue on the direction that we are. Now in the Dickens tale, the climax of the story probably occurs when Ebenezer Scrooge gets a visit from the ghost of Christmas yet to come. That scene is shown here in this original illustration. When this figure that's, that's shrouded in this deep black garment that conceals his form except for this one outstretched hand, the ghost shows Scrooge what the future holds, and he gets to see his funeral, which was attended only by a few businessmen because they got free lunch. And Scrooge gets to see Bob Cratchit and his family mourning the death of Tiny Tim. The ghost says, I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner and a crutch without an owner carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. And in that moment, Scrooge knows that he's got to change his ways, that the things that he's doing right now are going to lead to this outcome. So indulge me for a moment and imagine that we looked into the future. We got a visit from the ghost of matches yet to come. And we looked into the future in 2030 and we saw there was a world with no match. What events would have had to take place for this to occur? What could have made the match crumble? I mean, it could be some catastrophic event. It could be some black swan, something like a data breach or some kind of catastrophic clerical error that, uh, that diminished stakeholder trust in the match. But I actually don't think it would require all that. I think there are forces in play that could lead applicants and programs to believe that they can get a better deal outside of the match than within it. And even with federal antitrust protection, and even with an all-in clause, and even with all these mechanisms designed to keep this marketplace intact, we may be closer to the match unraveling, to a breaking point occurring, than people realize. And to understand how we got here, just like Ebenezer Scrooge, we need to look at the past, because the problems that we have in the future, they were set in motion by things that began long ago. For Scrooge, it was obvious. It was his greed. It was his focus on making money at the expense of anyone who came into his path. But for the match, it's over-application. Over-application is the root of many of the problems that we now face. It's enabled, of course, by the implementation of the Electronic Residency Application Service in the mid-1990s. Before then, applying to residency programs and scheduling your interviews were cumbersome. 
I mean, this was an era of typewriters and snail mail and requesting applications, getting documents from the dean's office, typing them up, getting on the phone to schedule your interviews. It imposed a very practical limit on the number of programs to which you wanted to apply and how many interviews you might accept. But as ERAS grew more sophisticated, all you needed was a credit card and a mouse, and you could apply to any number of programs just as easily as you could apply to one. However, at the very same time that ERAS was making it easier to apply to more programs, there was also a decrease in the relative number of PGY1 positions available for match applicants. This graphic here shows you the ratio of available positions per active match applicant. And as you can see, in the early 1990s, we actually had more positions available than we had applicants for those positions. Every year since, however, there's been a deficit of, of available positions for interested applicants. And although that, that, that ratio is not worsening, you can see it's been persistent over the past 25 years. The point here is there's mathematical certainty that not everyone is going to win on match day. The relative scarcity of positions ensures that there's going to be competition for those positions. And this is why students overapply. Sometimes I hear people say, usually they say this in defense of continued inaction, well, well, we don't even know what's driving over application. How are we supposed to fix it? I think that's a statement that's intentionally obtuse. Look, the etiology is simple. It's because students want to match. It's not any more complicated than that. After a student has spent their whole life building themselves up to the point where they are finally ready to take the last step in realizing their dream of becoming a physician, an applicant does not want to fall short and let someone else snatch that opportunity right out of their hands. And here's the reality. If you take two applicants who are otherwise identical, the same school, the same USMLE scores, the same academic background, they're identical in every way, but one of these applicants applies to a few more programs than the other. Who do you think has a better chance of matching? Yeah, you're right. It's the person who applies to more programs. And guess what? Students know this. Either explicitly or implicitly, students know this. Just last week, there was a paper out in an emergency medicine journal where they did some detailed evaluation of, of applicants in emergency medicine. The single biggest factor that drove students to apply to more programs was how many programs other applicants were applying to. And look, I promise this is true. I advise many students, and, and I like to think I have some content expertise in this area, and you might think that my, my, my recommendations could carry some weight. But I promise you, if I tell a student that she needs to apply to 15 programs, you know how many she's going to apply to? 18, maybe 21, maybe 25. A student will apply to however many programs they need to, and then a couple more. That's rational behavior. And to be honest, anyone who's on the other side of this now would do the same thing if they were in the student's shoes. Now, if that basic logic is not convincing to you, you can actually model the individual decision-making using this two-by-two two matrix. And that's what was done in this paper in the journal Graduate Medical Education in 2015. Basically, we have two applicants, as I mentioned, who are exactly the same in every way. The only way they can distinguish themselves is by choosing to apply to more or fewer programs. And the payoff in each of these cells is the percent likelihood that that applicant will go unmatched. That's a bad outcome, and all applicants seek to minimize that bad outcome. And when you model it in this way, it becomes very apparent that that over-application, choosing to apply to more programs, is a dominant strategy. That is the only way that an applicant can achieve their best outcome, and it's the only way that they can avoid their worst outcome. Overapplication is not going to go away on its own. And so each year, applicants apply to more and more programs. And as applicants apply to more programs, the next year's group needs to apply to more programs still. Last year, the average international medical graduate applied to 139 programs. The average US graduate, 70. And I sometimes have people who want to challenge me on this point. They'll say, yeah, but, 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 but the, the curve is flattening. See, the IMG curve has been flat for several years. The market's getting saturated. We don't need to do anything about that. I think that's a bold, if not a foolhardy take. It might be the case that the, the number of programs that IMGs apply to is saturated because, to be frank, there are some programs that are unwilling to consider international medical graduates. But the ceiling on U.S. medical graduates and on DO graduates, it is very high. 
And if you think that we've reached it already, I think you got another think coming. So what does this do for students? It creates an arms race where every year they have to apply to more and more programs and they have to spend more and more money doing so. And this is the current landscape. This is the mean application submitted by each specialty. Note that traditionally competitive specialties like dermatology, neurosurgery, orthopedics, urology, those are leading the pack. But this, the data that I'm showing you is only for USMDs. And so even specialties like my own, like pediatrics or specialties like internal medicine that get relatively few applications per applicant for US graduates still get many applications from international medical graduates. In internal medicine, for instance, the average IMG applies to over 100 programs. So this 33 starts to not look real good when you're a program director who's receiving all of the applications from all of the people who choose to, to apply to your program. A better way of looking at it is like this, the applications received by a program per each available position that they're trying to fill. And this is the current state of affairs. This creates an incredible evaluative burden for programs, and it necessitates the use of convenient screening metrics like USMLE scores, which as you know, is something that kind of sticks in my craw and is often the aspect of, of this system that I'm interested in talking about. But today, that's not my focus. Instead, what I want people who are listening to think about is what happens when we use these convenience metrics. Because all programs have access to the same filters. Maybe you use USMLE scores. Maybe you use need for visa sponsorship or MD versus DO or AOA status. The point here is that applicants who look good to one program typically look good to other programs too. And what that means is that applicants get overinvited to interview. We have some literature on this. A paper that used 2016 match data, 2016, found that in some specialties like general surgery or internal medicine, 12% of applicants consumed 50% of all the interview positions available. I don't think that's gonna get better. And there are data that show that applicants have gradually been accepting more interview offers. From 2019, the NRMP applicant survey, we, we know that the median number of interviews that was attended for applicants who matched uh, was 10. By 2019, that number was up to 13, and that was before COVID-19 and the advent of virtual interviewing, which does offer many advantages, and I think it's going to be something that's going to last even after the pandemic is over. But let's be honest, it makes it much more possible for um, a very qualified applicant to consume even more interview offers. And from the program side, it's not just the time that it takes to go through applications. Interviewing applicants is expensive, and it's expensive even with virtual interviews. There was a paper in an ophthalmology journal in 2018 that estimated that the cost of interviewing each applicant at this program was $3,736. That's each applicant. And most of that is due to lost faculty clinical productivity, insofar as anybody who was spending professional time interviewing could have instead been engaged in the gainful practice of ophthalmologic surgery. The point here is that programs simply cannot continue to increase the number of, of people that they interview to account for the fact that applicants are applying to more programs and from a standpoint of simple statistics, they have a less and less likelihood of matching a given person because that person's applying and interviewing at more places than they used to in the past. It's expensive. And if each year it gets a little worse, if you're a program, how long would you keep doing this? And that brings us to the present day, the ghost of matches present. And here what I want to do is I want to think in real terms about what is going on right now at a typical residency program in the year 2020 and why, if you care about the longevity of the match, the trends that we've shown on the previous slides, they should make you think about what might be coming next. As we all know, in America, most things work in the free market. You take your goods down to the market space and, and you sell them for whatever price you think people will buy them at and, and the laws of supply and demand dictate whether your goods or services get bought by someone else or not. The match isn't like that. It's a designed marketplace and people have a choice of whether to participate or not. If you want to voluntarily subject yourself to the extra rules that apply inside this de designed market space, then you can, but you don't have to. and and most programs participate in the match because they get a better outcome by participating in the match than they would have by trying to operate outside it. And the same is true for most applicants. 
but you need to recognize that that calculus can change. Put yourself in the position of a program that's getting more and more applications. Say that you're a typical smaller internal medicine residency program with 12 residents a year and you get 1,000 or 1,200 applications into your program. Well, even if you just spent five minutes, just five minutes evaluating each one of those applications because you, as a matter of principle, didn't think that, that using filters was the right thing to do, just five minutes is going to take over 100 hours of professional time to review all those applications. And sure, you can split it up among multiple people and have five people take 20 hours of professional time to do it, but it's a big burden. And let's say that you, you decide to interview maybe 200 applicants to make sure that your program fills. How many faculty members are you going to have to recruit to fill in those interview spots? I mean, if you want three people, three faculty members, let's say, to interview each of them, that's 600 spots. You got to find 600 faculty, and this is in COVID times when departments' budgets are stretched and when clinical services are often hard to staff as it is, and you want people to do interviews. And maybe you do all those things if all that expense and all that burden, at the end of the day, when March comes around, your program fills and it fills with good applicants. But suppose your program goes unfilled. And I, I think, as, as I think do many, that we're going to see an increase in the number of unfilled programs this year because as students interview at more programs, um, they're still only going to go to one. And so if, if a program has the, the unfortunate circumstance of focusing their recruitment on people who choose to go elsewhere, a, a very good program may go unfilled. And so if you go through all of that, and at the end of the day, your program is unfilled, what do you think about next year? I mean, what are you going to do next year? You've got a few options. I mean, one, you could just run it back. You could just do the same thing all over again, interview the same number of people, do the same evaluation process, et cetera. And maybe you'll get a better result, but you probably don't have any reason to think that you would. You may get burned again. You could try to interview more people. You could say, all right, well, we got to interview 300 people. And good luck getting the funding from your department chair. I mean, good luck getting the faculty time and the buy-in for, for people to do it. Good luck keeping your job, to be honest, if you, if you go unmatched more than a, a year or two. Another option B, you could compromise your principles and you could compromise your standards. You could say, you know, we're no longer going to interview the applicants who we think are the best. We're going to say, oh, this person's from the West Coast. They're not coming to our program, even though they're very qualified. We're going we're gonna to not interview them. We're going to interview somebody instead who, who isn't somebody that we think is the best on the front end. And you could do that. It's a very pragmatic thing to do, but in a way it's antithetical to the very thing that you're trying to accomplish with all your recruitment e efforts, which is to get the best residents into your program and to do something that's so explicitly at cross purposes of what your primary goal in residency recruitment is. It just doesn't feel right. And somewhere, some program may start to think about a fourth option. They may start to think about themselves to themselves, you know what? Maybe we just pull out of the match. Maybe we just put out a sign. Maybe we fill outside the match. And maybe if your program leadership is insightful and has their finger on the pulse of, of current trends, maybe they'll perceive that there's a growing group of applicants who feel like they're not well served by the match either. They find it increasingly stressful and financially burdensome, and they wish that they could apply and interview for jobs like any other regular job in society. Not long ago, someone shared with me some data uh, from a survey of, of match applicants last year. So this is pre-COVID-19. And there was one figure in the survey that caught my eye because around 60% of the survey respondents in this particular survey said that they did not believe that the current residency application process was fair and equitable. 60%. And if you had a program leadership that instead of just withdrawing from the match with their tail between their legs, was willing to articulate a vision to applicants about how the whole residency selection process has gone awry and that the whole thing is rotten and that it's hurting applicants and that it's hurting programs and, and it's only enriching our corporate over overlords. If someone were willing to articulate that vision, it could create a social movement. It could cause other programs to, to stand behind them and pull out from the match. And, and if programs saw that good applicants were being snapped up by programs outside of the match, then this designed marketplace will lose its thickness and the whole process will unravel.
And if the match unravels, we'll be back to the bad old days of exploding offers and high pressure tactics to get applicants to commit earlier and earlier before they get snapped up by your competition. And I'll be honest, there are some aspects of a free market residency selection system that are appealing to me, but I don't overall think it's going to be a benefit for us. If you're an applicant, if you're a high quality applicant, yeah, you might be able to call your shots in, the, in a free market and you might be able to get a, as good or better of a deal as you do now as programs compete over you. But you got to remember this. We live in a world where there's more applicants than there are positions available. And the laws of supply and demand indicate that when we have an excess supply relative to the demand, prices drop. Working conditions may get worse we may end up with a system that's much worse for the average applicant and for the average program than what we have now. But understand this, just because the match unraveling might make the system worse doesn't mean that we won't get there. It's just like the situation with over-application currently. Over-application ultimately doesn't help programs or applicants. But the fact that it occurs, it's the sum total of all of the individual decisions that, that applicants make to advantage themselves. And it's the same thing with the match unraveling. All it takes is for programs to believe, credibly, that they can get a better deal outside the match than within it. And they'll move outside the match. And when they do, applicants will flock to them. And the more programs that leave, the more applicants will leave. So what do you think? Does that sound far-fetched? I don't think so. And I think if you think it does, you should believe that at your own peril. From my standpoint, the current system is unsustainable. Overapplication is not going to end on its own. In a very best case scenario, we reach the flat of the curve for applications and everybody just learns to work within a system that's more chaotic and unnecessarily expensive. But in a worst case scenario, the whole thing comes undone. And I don't think that's unlikely at all. From my standpoint, we can choose to act now or we can choose to act later. And for the sake of programs and applicants alike, I hope we choose the former. That's all I've got. Thanks for listening.